welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners. Today I'm joined by head coach, a fitness coach and nutritionist to talk about creating a holistic periodization training plan. Um, before I get the opportunity to introduce you to Sebastian Lopez Bascon, Jao Tralao, and Matt Jones. I um, just want to share with you the schedule for today's discussion. We'll just get that on the screen. So, in the first half of the show, the guys will uh, give you each a presentation which will sort of cover their the key pillars of their approaches to periodization. Um, following the presentations, we'll bring the three of them together to see sort of how that collaboration across a multidisciplinary team with uh, Jao Tralao as our head coach will be setting the tone and then we'll see how Sebastian and Matt Jones as sort of fitness coach and nutritionists sort of work off that to produce this kind of holistic periodization plan that sort of drives home the sort of fitness and, and nutrition levels of a team. Um, and as we sort of get into the sort of the second half and sort of latter parts of the, the conversation, through the memo sort of how they're sort of analyzing and evaluating that training plan, how they're doing that, and then the decisions that they're making around adjustments. And again, how each little change will affect each other's way of working. Um, so we can get to all of that, let me introduce you to each of the guys. Um, I'll start with uh, Matt Jones, sort of um, consultant nutritionist at West Ham, Brentford and Chelsea Women. How, how are you today, Matt? I'm very well, thanks, Steve. Thanks for the invitation and uh, obviously the introduction. Um, a little bit tired after yesterday's game, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing some ideas with uh, these two great guys. Um, yeah, it's just whenever you obviously I've sort of given what, what you're doing now. I wonder if you could sort of share with us a little bit of your your past experiences uh, leading up to, to your work. Yeah, yeah. Point. Well, it, I guess if we start right from the beginning, I was an avid footballer growing up. I uh, tore my ACL twice at 17 and then again at 19. I started reading about nutrition because no one ever told me what to do. Like to nutrition wise, I found myself getting kind of tubby. I was a little bit <laughs> overweight um, on crutches and everything. And um, yeah, that my fascination with the impact of food and, and, and different supplements and things on, on recovery and, and nutrition health and everything like that was, it just grew from there really. And, um, I was fortunate enough to take on internships at what the Welsh rugby union and then Liverpool as well. Um, and then from there, my, my career pretty much began. So started working at Stoke city. So that was my first real, uh, big club. Um, I was there for maybe three or four years and then. Uh, went over to work with uh, a unit of the armed forces uh, over in the Middle East as well when um, when I was working with Stoke so it was a weird role and then Saudi Arabia national team uh, and Flamengo CR Flamengo over in Brazil um, and yeah like like most of us here uh, football takes you pretty much everywhere um, so it was it was quite a journey in uh, most recently America uh, over at the University of Oregon um, and then back back here back home to England essentially um, as, as a consultant with uh, with the clubs you mentioned just before yeah that's wow it's kind of a, a whistle stop tour of the world pretty much yeah well I guess in the early stages of your career you just want to learn and, and like develop as, as quickly as possible and I found right at the beginning of my career I knew how to manage the diet of, a, of an English player I knew the habitual diet I knew the challenges they faced um, but I, when when I was faced with like an international player, so that someone came from Africa, for instance, I, I really didn't understand much about their habitual diet or the challenges they face culturally and, and things like that. So and the environmental challenges. So I just went out and, and tried to in in like basically just learn as much as I can within those environments. So going out into the desert and, and learning how to manage hydration status in the middle of a desert is uh, there's no bigger challenges than that, really. So um yeah just go go with the flow 
Yeah, well, we'll we'll see. Maybe maybe today will be a, an even bigger challenge. We'll we'll see what it yeah. has in store for you. Um, let's bring in Jao Tralao. Jao, how are how are you today? Hi, uh, hi Steve. Um, first, thank you for the invitation. It's a uh, it's really a pleasure to be here to discuss with so such a uh, good guys in football like like Sebastian and Matt. Uh, I think that would be a very good discussion because these three areas, uh, I think we, we can cross a lot and do not see it as an isolation, isolated areas. But of course, in terms of what I represent as a coach, uh, I prefer to see everything integrated. And I, I think it will be a very good discussion around these, these three areas. So first, thank you for, for, for the invitation. Uh, thank you guys, Matt and Sebastian, to be part of as well of the discussion. And of course, thank you all the participants that they are here on Sunday morning. It's not easy. It's not easy schedule, but thank you guys. Uh, probably I have some good friends here watching us uh, discussion, and for sure it will be uh, important for us to, to to have an interactive uh, discussion because we I think we I, I believe that we can learn with each other. Fantastic, Joe. Yeah. Um, just want to yeah, just share. With us, um, a little bit of your, your background in, in football. Yeah, my background was, uh, I started, uh, I started my, my career when, when, I was, when I was mainly starting my, my, my academic life. Um, I, I played, as, I played as, a, as a football player, not highest level like, like we, I would like to, but I played in the amateur level and then I, I decided to be a coach, my passion for coaching started when I started my academic career. And so then I, I, I have the opportunity to work in, in Benfica, the grassroots uh, age groups. Then I, I grew up till I, I achieved, I believe, a good level in under 23 uh, level as a head coach. And then, of course, I, I have the invitation from my good friend Thierry Henry to work with him in Monaco as a staff member. And it was was my last experience as a coach and yeah it's my background all right brilliant thanks Joe. um and finally let me introduce you all to sebastian lopez vascon so sebastian how are you doing today hi steve uh, first of all thanks for the invitation it's a pleasure for me to to share the screen with matt and you all i think it's going to be a very interesting conversation uh, around a very interesting topic uh, yeah Pleasure to be here with everyone, and thanks for for inviting me to the show. No, no, we're very, very grateful to have you have you with us. Um, I just wanted, yeah, like like the other guys, you just sort of share a little bit of your your footballing journey to date. Yeah, uh, as you all say, that uh, I was also playing football, but uh, on a, at an amateur level. So I'm kind of a frustrated football player that wanted to keep a link with football somehow. So from a very young age, I started to coach teams in a local level. Then I started my academic path uh, through sports science. So this took me a little bit to the fitness part and everything. Uh, and then I started to, to work as a, as a fitness coach. Uh, I traveled a little bit around the world. First, uh, I went to Holland when, when I was still a student. Uh, I did an internship with, with Vitesse uh, in the fitness part where I met a team was uh, at the show last Wednesday, if I remember well. And after that, I went to the USA to keep studying there and also playing football with a scholarship and everything. I wanted to, to see a little bit how they work out uh, all the fitness part and all the training concepts that they have in the American model, let's say. And after that, I came back to my hometown, to Seville. Uh, I started my master program in football conditioning and fitness. Uh, I started to work in Sevilla at the academy level. Um, then I joined uh, the staff of uh, Manuel Jimenez, uh, who's the head coach that I'm working with for the last four years. Uh, we have been a little bit uh, around the world, uh, mainly in Greece, for uh, three seasons. Then we went to Las Palmas here in Spain, the Spanish league. Uh, our last experience was a couple of months ago in UAE where we were working for al Wahda, who is a club from Abu Dhabi. Uh, now, here we are, just waiting for, for the next challenge. 
Yeah, okay, brilliant, Sebastian Well, uh, yeah, this is this is the, the next challenge for now. Um, so we'll sort of jump straight in, guys, with the uh, presentations. Um, let's begin with uh, Jao Tralao. So Jao, allow you to uh, jump in and, and take over the screen. Yeah. Can you see, guys? Yes, perfect job. So, oh, uh, in resume, I will try to, to explain uh, what do I think about periodization. Uh, of course, my, my main focus it will be tactical periodization. I will explain in resume lines what, what that means for me as a coach. So, first of all, I would like to say that uh, my training methodology, I, I have the opportunity, and I have the, the privilege to build my, my own methodology. Of course, I have a lot of influence from everywhere, but I, I build my, my, my methodology, I build my, my ideas, my guidelines in terms of what I believe in terms of training methodology. So I believe in tactical periodization method. Uh, I will explain what, of course, in resume lines because I, I think I have 10 minutes to, to talk and I think the main discussion will be after. Uh, but what I, what, I, what I think about tactical periodization, first, the first step, in my opinion, is to ask what what will be the identity of my team. So, uh, in terms of why I, I choose that utilization, why I choose this kind of method. First, the first question I used to, to ask is what I, what will be the identity of my team? What kind of identity my team will have when we go into the pitch? So, first, uh, we cannot talk about methods without uh, talking about way of playing idea. I think the first the first step to build our method is to have an idea, is to have the, the guidance, is to have the path that we want to follow to, to, to play in a certain way of playing idea. So uh, this way of playing idea is based on principles in every dimension. Dimensions, I, I used to divide the game in, in six dimensions, um, the psychological, the tactical, the physical, the technical, the social and cognitive. So these dimensions, I, I, I build, uh, I, I had built a structure with a lot of principles around this, this dimension. All the dimensions are integrated, all dimensions uh, I see as an holistic uh, view or perspective of, of, of the game. So uh, I have principles for every dimension, but principles, of course, link with just only one idea of playing. My idea is not here, is, I think it's not important to, to mention, but uh, for me, the main thing I, I would like to focus is, as a coach, I believe that we should have an idea to follow, we should have an idea to play. Uh, to play. So, when I build my idea, the structure is based on, first, mm -hmm. the macro principles. So, the macro principles resume our way of playing identity magic guidelines. I can give an example. Uh, in, I used to split the game in, in four phases. The first phase is the build-up, the second phase is preparation, the third phase is creation, and the fourth phase is finishing. And if you see in the other way, uh, defensive way, it's the pressure, pressure, zonal, zonal, and of course, depending on our, our, our box, so our goal. So it, I can give an example in terms of macro principles. Macro principles, the attacking process, if we want to build with possession, we want to build with session style, uh, my first principle, my macro principle is really big. So I want to build with uh, possession, I want to build with short passes, I want to build uh, to, to control the game with short passes. So this is a macro principle. Then I have the principles, Princi principles, but it's basic, basically the interactions between all the sectors and individuals. So one of the principles is to open space, to give some angle, to have uh, passing lines secure, to have uh, the possibility to play short. So, and then I define the sub principles, and the sub principles for me means the detail, the principle detail. What, why, where I should go, when I should move, when uh, to where space I, I need to to to, 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 to go to, to have control on the spaces. Blah, 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 blah. So, this kind of structure, it's my structure in terms of principles in every dimension of the game. 
And then, of course, the identity, I believe that is not only our idea, because our idea could be uh, limited. If I have a good idea based on principles, based on everything structure, but if I don't train the same way, if I don't have a methodology to fulfill everything I want to do, apply in, in our game, I think it, it will be very limited. In, in, in the other hand, it's the same. So if I have a very good methodology, and but I don't have a path to follow, I think it's limited. So I believe that the connection between the tactical periodization structure, so the, the learning methodology, and the idea that I have for my, my game, I think this kind of connection really will give us our game idea. So that's why I believe in training methodology. And one of the things that I focus the most to prepare our, our, our process. So then what we should work? Um, like I said before, uh, the structure is, is, is built by macro principles first, then principles and then sub-principles. I give you here a small example uh, in terms of offensive process, uh, the macro principles, it will be built in possession in the first phase of the game. The principles will be, uh, all the principles linked with, this, uh, with these spaces and with these zones and these uh, phases. And then I have the sub-principles, uh, that's the details, where, blah, blah, blah. When do we should apply this kind of methodology. Uh, I, I can say that it's every week, every session, every exercise, every hour, every minute, we should uh, think what we have to work to play under a certain idea. And uh, I give you some example, and then I can show you what, but how we build our week in terms of uh, periodization. Uh, and, uh, hey, I give you, uh, here, here I give you two examples a week with uh, one match uh, per week, but if a second example with two matches, how do we build our week to, to, to organize the content to, to progress during the week in terms of tactical um, periodization, and then we can explain with detail after. So the starting point is always, when we build our week, the starting point is always our game model idea principles, what I want what, what I want to develop is the way we want to play. So the main objectives is to promote a team-specific development. So in terms of what you want as a team, uh, development of the sectors specifically, of course, and of course, individual development in terms of, of course, not individual isolated. Like I, I want a player to be more, uh, more, more fast. I want to, to, to a player to, to be more strong. I want to play with a very long pass, no, it's not like this, it's individual, but specifically. So, uh, play under certain idea, the, the, that player, that individual should play, should make a pass in terms of what you want as a team. This is our main, main focus in terms of objective development. Okay. So, it depends always, I can tell you, all the week, the, the planning of the week depends on game model idea principles, like I tell, like I told you before, the last match, the last match reflection, uh, because uh, we we plan to maximize our team, and we prioritize to maximize our team, to maximize how we want to uh, go to the match, to, 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 and to play much more stronger in terms of what I, we want as an idea. The next ma match preparation, of course, is related. Uh, the team moment, because the team moment influence and we have a lot of impact in the week um, build up, of course, the players' moment and the content could be uh, we can be in preparation, uh, we can be in competition, we can, we can be, uh, we can have two weeks off. It depends on always on. So, in terms of training methodology, major guidelines, uh, the build. The build-up of the week, it's, 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 in my opinion, uh, I think it's important to, to progress from small to large spaces, start the week with small spaces and evolve to and progress to large spaces. Um, in terms of content, tactical content, I believe that we should start the week with 
expensive content and then progress to attacking content and finish the week with what we want in terms of attacking style. Why? Uh, because um, I have a, an attacking minded uh, approach to the game. And I, I believe that I will attack. And I, I always attack and my main focus is attack. And I want to give this message to, 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 to the players, the team, I want to show them that we want to attack. Our main focus is to attack. So that's why at the last day of the week, my main focus is only attack. I use I used to, to use condition games with real game situations, not only to maximize the time of the session, but uh, because I, I, I believe that this kind of exercises give us more control on, on the learning process and to maximize everything in terms of our game. Uh, do not waste time doing things that is not specific. Uh, I used to use a lot of condition games, small-sided games, medium-sided games, but mainly condition games with rules, with real game situations. Uh, I used to isolate a certain moment or phase of the game, like I told you, I, I, I divide the, the game in four phases, and then I used to develop some content linked with it. And at all moments, at all exercises, I used to have three rules in my, three components in my exercise. So when I build the exercise, uh, the exercise should have a direction, a goal or a line, something to, to guide the, the behaviors of the players, the, the actions of the players to, to a certain direction. All position could be, of course, smaller, could be much, much more intensive, but all position to develop the, the decision-making qualities. For me, it's very important to play under my, my, my idea. And then, of course, a, a, a third component is the transition moment. So when I build the exercise, it's not only attack, and then they stop, or not only defend, then they stop. When they attack, it could be a simple thing that, okay, you are attacking, you lose the ball, then you need to do something uh, defensive or, or react, or react to a, uh, something elsewhere, or to a player, to press the player, in, or, or in the other hand, if you are defending, when you win the ball, when we win the ball, what we should do to attack better. Okay, uh, Steve, I think my, my time was, was okay. I don't know if I have more time to present, but th th that's, that's what I believe that, um, about the tactical position. You resume, of course, major guidelines. If you have any question or if you have any uh, thing to ask, please, please do us. No, no, I think that's uh, great there. Zhao is a kind of opening foundation for, for today's topic and discussion. Um, and obviously the slides that you have there and ones that you may have left over, we can dip into as, as the discussion progresses. So I think, yeah, we have a sort of understanding of your, your main pillars there for the tactical periodization. Um, sort of now move to Sebastian and sort of, yeah, have a look at the same topic, but through the lenses of a, of a fitness coach. So uh, Sebastian, I uh, give the screen over to you. Yeah. Can you see my screen already, Steve? Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So I'm going to speak from the fitness coach perspective about how to plan or how to uh, make the periodization of the week. Uh, but first of all, I would like to say that uh, I strongly believe that is, there is no uh, a, a way from the fitness coach perspective itself in an isolated way. So I'm going to speak about what I think when I have to get to this agreement with the coach and with the rest of the staff about how I'm going to plan it but I'm gonna speak about mainly the fitness part, let's say, or the things that I have to take into account. So first of all, for me, uh, the microcycle periodization is a dynamic open process. So it's not something that is stable, it's something that is changeable. And every time you are readjusting everything that you have periodized, let's say, um, for me, includes the selection, the organization, uh, and the analysis of the different training contents that we wanna work out and uh, also the training methods that we're going to use in order to optimize or to maximize not just the team performance but also the individual performance 
of our players. And in order to, to make that micro cycle, I think we have to follow some steps as a fitness coach. First step for me will be to define which type of micro cycle are we facing. So depending on the game day and the previous, uh, the previous days, uh, the previous game, we're going we're gonna to see which kind of microcycle, how our microcycle is going to look like. So how many days are we going to have in order to train? And depending on that, which contents are we going to be able to put inside the training? So I think competition is a reference and it's going to be the one who's going to determine what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, when are we going to do it, basically. Uh, for me, the second step will be to differentiate the phases within the microcycle. For me, there are three main phases. Uh, the recovery phase, overload phase, and the tapering phase. And I think you have to be very clear about when one starts, when the other one finishes. So we have to really set up uh, goals for each of the phases. and We have to uh, have clear objectives in our mind about what are we challenging in each of the phases. So as long as we have these phases, we have to set up and put them inside our microcycle, depending on the previous step that we just uh, commented before. And taking into account that, in my opinion, you will have almost as many microcycles as players you have. So it doesn't mean that because uh, we are in a recovery phase, it doesn't mean that the whole team is in a recovery phase. There can be players that can be in another phase of the microcycle. They can be in the overload phase. Uh, for example, starters, non-starter situation. So I think we have to really pay attention to, to that part and the individual needs. Uh, the next step for me will be the content selection. As I said before, it's not only the fitness uh, part selection. You also have to focus as Joao just said on the different contents that the, the coach want to work on basic on how we want our team to behave in the pitch and which is our team identity. But uh, I'm going to speak mainly in, in my presentation about the, the fitness content, let's say. So I just put there some examples about some of the contents that me as a fitness coach, I want to assure my team is going to do depending on which microcycle we are. I'm going to put them all or I'm going to put some of them on when or how I'm going to put them and how I'm going to work on them. But I think it's, it's very important to, to, to have a, a clear picture of which contents I, I want to work on during this week and which is going to be the main focus of each of the days in terms of fitness also. So I want to, to assure that I'm giving the players the, the right stimulus and all the stimulus that I think they are necessary for them in order to cope with the game demands afterwards. Uh, next step for me will be the, the analysis of, of the training dose, not just the, the fitness part in terms of the spaces, the dimensions that we have worked on, if we just work in small spaces or if we are working in different spaces or not, if we are uh, meeting the, the set uh, demands that we, we plan for each of the days in terms of percentage uh, in comparison with the game, uh, but also uh, about the, the type of, of drills that I think sometimes we, we lose the focus, uh, mainly the fitness coaches, and this is a critic for, for, my, for my professional, let's say a little bit. I think we are, we are losing the focus and we are just analyzing the load in terms of physical load, but we are not analyzing the load in other components. So we are not thinking if the drills we are proposing are uh, always the same kind of drills and if we are exposing our players to moments and to uh, uh, situations that they are going to have to face in the game. So it's not only about analyzing if I have played only in small spaces or if I play also in big spaces and the kind of runs have happened or not. Also about if these runs were always offensively or were always defending. I think we have to take into account in this analysis all these uh, contents and also of course, the mental part that these uh, uh, drills are going to, how they're going to impact in, in my players. And the last step for me will be the reorganization of the different contents and the readjustments of the training dose. So it's not only about 
which is the load that I am proposing, but also about what is really happening here. So I think you have to, to check if what you believe you are doing is really happening there or not. Maybe you think you are delivering one thing that is not happening at all. So once again, I think it's a very dynamic and open process that needs flexibility and adaptation at each moment of the process. And in order to conclude, uh, I will say some of the main principles that I take into uh, to account when I am gonna design the, the microcycle with, with the staff. So for me, uh, for us, competition is the reference. Uh, everything has to be based on what we want uh, to happen on the game day, not just in physical terms, but also in which is the behavior that we want our team to have in the pitch, how we want them to behave in the different situations that they are gonna face. So about our team identity and also our player characteristics, everything's gonna be based on that. Communication uh, organization within the staff is key. I think we all have to know exactly where do we wanna go so we can go in the most effective and efficient way. Um, training has to be based on our game model once again. So we need to know what we want in order to do it. If we don't know what we want, it's difficult to do it. Uh, another rule for me would be to follow the training principles. I think uh, common sense has to be there. Uh, I, and you have to follow that. Uh, very important to pay attention to the individual needs. Uh, at the end, we, we have a team that is uh, uh, made by 25 different individuals. Uh, in Spain, we, we always say that every player is from one mother and one father, so they are totally different. So we have to pay really attention to these kind of needs. Uh, the alternation of the main focus in each of the session, uh, what I mean by that is that we, we have to try to alternate, based on my point of view, uh, the contents and the load in the different days. So try not to repeat two days in a row exactly the same kind of uh, drills, uh, components of, of training. So I think each session should have a main focus and it should differ from session to session. And then also to give at least one high intensity metabolic stimulus and one high demanding neuromuscular stimulus, which will be part of the overload phase in order to improve the performance of, or, or the preparation of our team, or at least to maintain the, the levels that we, we already have. Uh, once again, to make an estimation of the proposed training load. So before I propose the training load, I have to know what I'm proposing. But after this, even more important, I have to analyze and compare if this really happened there. Uh, and that will be for, for me, Steve. I don't know if I am on time. <clears throat> no, perfect, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, So yeah, I'm finally able to sort of uh, bring Matt Jones into uh, sort of get the uh, nutritionist's uh, view on periodization. Okay, let me just. Okay, yeah. So uh, obviously, following on from uh, Xiao and Sebastian, I'll briefly touch on uh, the impact of like the, the training periodization model on on the diet, essentially on on food. Um, and, and how I would structure uh, nutrition and, and the periodized uh, menu, if you like, um, around, around that. I guess periodized nutrition is fairly new in comparison to um, the periodization of training and the periodization of strength training particularly. So uh, I, I guess it's initially worthwhile just putting out um, uh, a definition. So uh, asking you can drop uh, uh, defined periodization or periodized nutrition um, as the strategic uh, or combined use of exercise training and nutrition or nutrition only uh, with the overall objective uh, to ob ob obtain adaptations that support exercise performance. Uh, so ultimately it's about um, the objective is to manipulate the diet or use the diet to support adaptations, uh, maximize preparation um, and also support recovery to, to optimize performance. Um, you can also think about it in, in another way. So you can think about performance as the starting point um, and then using food uh, to, to support that performance. 
Um, I guess essentially what that means is uh, we're providing the right fuel uh, in the correct quantities um, at the optimal times uh, to maximize adaptations, uh, performance, um, and then also recovery. Um, adaptations is in, um, in italics there because sometimes uh, we know from, from recent research, sometimes um, that means providing no fuel at all. So we know that um, actually exercising in the glycogen depleted state or, or the fatigued state can actually produce some, some beneficial effects on uh, various physiological out, um, outcomes. So the aerobic uh, phenotype, so the aerobic adaptations, um, I'll, I'll touch on this in a second, I'm sure. Uh, but sometimes it means uh, providing no fuel at all. But ultimately, the, uh, the periodized approach to nutrition um, is, is essentially the, providing the right fuel in the correct quantities at, at the right times. Um, again, again, just kind of echoing what uh, Zhao said initially, uh, my role as a nutritionist and, and my, my periodized approach to nutrition begins with the game itself. So we have the principles that obviously Zhao touched on. So we have the psychological elements, the technical, tactical, um, and physical elements. Um, initially, we, we knew that, for, well, we have known for many years that nutrition can have a, a big, a big beneficial effect on the physical aspects of the game. So uh, re repeated sprints uh, can be supported by carbohydrate, for instance, and carbohydrate can also um, kind of minimize the effects of fatigue in the second half. Um, so we've, we've known that for, for many years. We've also begin to, uh, begun to have a better understanding of the impact of, of um, nutrition uh, and various nutrition interventions on technical aspects of the game. So passing accuracy, uh, control, um, shooting ability, things like that, that, they can all be supported by, uh, by nutrition. Again, carbohydrate and caffeine in combination can have a big impact there. Um, in recent years, we've known that, uh, or we've begun to understand uh, that indirectly, or, or maybe even directly, uh, nutrition can impact uh, tactical aspects as well. So, for instance, uh, it, fatigue fatigue can result in substitutions and, ch and change in tactics, uh, body composition as well. If, if, if someone is not the, of, of a suitable body composition, then obviously they're, they're unlikely to be able to play uh, for a full 90 minutes or maintain the playing style for a full 90 minutes. So the nutrition might have an indirect effect on tactical aspects as well. Um, and then even more recently, we've started to understand that nutrition can also impact uh, the psychological aspects of the game. So certain nutrients um, can serve as new, uh, um, precursors to neurotransmitters. So a neurotransmitter is a chemical signal that acts on the brain to support cognitive processes. So decision-making, memory, um, feelings of fatigue or, or lethargy as well, potentially. Um, so obviously adapting uh, the, the nutrition intervention and the, the nutrition or the periodized plan to support psychological aspects is, is growing. Um, and it's really, it's really quite technical. Um, but for instance, if, if uh, Zhao, the head coach, was uh, having like more of a tactical um, or, a t or potentially even a technical focus, uh, the last thing I want to do is uh, provide a meal uh, to a player that makes them feel lethargic or, or quite tired, um, I would prefer to have them quite, like with, with more dopamine. So dopamine is um, is a neurotransmitter that makes you feel quite alert and, and awake. Um, so obviously the, the the periodized approach prior to that session will be slightly different um, to to support those psychological aspects. Um, so uh, again, it, it all starts with with the, the game itself. And then it kind of stems out from there. And we have a, a good understanding now that nutrition can really impact uh, various aspects of, of uh, football performance and not only the, the traditional idea that it can only impact the, the physical aspects, really. Um, ultimately, it all boils down to communication. So as a, as a nutritionist, it, it's essential for me to understand what the objective of that day is or, or the objective of the, the, the micro cycle is. Um, so obviously, um, Sebastian talked about high speed running. So we know that caffeine and, and potentially sodium bicarbonate can, uh, and beta alanine uh, can really benefit um, speed and repeated sprint ability. Uh, so the provision of those nutrients or those supplements at those times can be, can be really beneficial. Whereas uh, small sided games, so accelerations, decelerations, that's going to put um, or, or that's going to result in a, a significant amount of muscle damage. Uh, so reducing inflammation afterwards um, is going to be really important as well. Um, so obviously inflammation is uh, 
a, a result of uh, the muscle damage. Uh, we also know that muscle damage from those eccentric contractions can impair glycogen resynthesis as well. So uh, the, the resynthesis of fuel within the muscle. So that's going to have a big impact on the carbohydrate recovery intervention. Uh, so there's a number of uh, a number of things that need to be communicated in order for the nutrition intervention to properly align with uh, with the periodized training model and, and the, the, the technical and tactical periodization as well. Um, but again, it all starts with, with the game and, and it feeds out from there. Uh, so ultimately, if we start from the game, uh, the questions I would have for, for the head coach would be what the, what formation. So obviously the the. the the football is the starting point and then we can obviously assess the demands and then that will ultimately inform the, the nutrition intervention. Um, so the questions that I would have is obviously the formation, the playing style, uh, the frequency of games, uh, the competition or the opposition, uh, potentially even the time of season. So obviously later, later in the season there's likely to be fatigue and, and recent results as well. So we know that uh, practically um, a loss uh, so if, you, if you've lost a game, if you've lost a few games on the trot, that can have a massive impact upon uh, the, the, the application of nutrition because after the game, players are psychologically not brought into the whole recovery intervention. So they'll probably just disappear. Um, so it's uh, recent results, although it probably shouldn't, it does impact um, nutrition and the application of nutrition, uh, fitness levels, and also environmental conditions. So... Uh, if we just focus on like the 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 playing style, for instance, or or the formation, so this is where the individual approach really comes into play. So if we have a centre forward like a, a six foot seven, perhaps, and he's uh, like obviously a target man, if for want of a better term, um, his game is going to be considerably different to uh, a player that plays on the last man and kind of makes runs quite frequently. Um, so his nutrition intervention is going to be considerably different because the demands he has or the game demands um, are, are considerably different. So that then feeds into a different nutrition intervention. So if we take a big target man, for instance, he, the, 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 the principles or, the, or the, the physiological characteristics of that individual are going to be like strength and, and, and holding people off. Uh, so we know that creatine monohydrate and, and things like that will be beneficial for for that guy where and the energy requirements are probably going to be a little bit lower whereas if you have um, a, a, play, a, a center forward that plays on the last man and, and feeds off that target man he's going to be sprinting more so his his game demands uh, are going to be considerably different so the nutrition intervention is then going to be considerably different for that individual as well um, so yeah it all begins with with the game with with football uh, we can then assess the demands of the game uh, using various data streams, so, so GPS, uh, subjective data, uh, just general conversations and observations of the game. So it, it helps that the nutritionist has a good understanding of the game itself. Um, body composition um, assessments, wellness data, uh, immune function, hydration status, and, and recovery status. Uh, that can then all inform uh, the nutrition intervention and the periodized approach to nutrition. Um, so from, from a nutrition perspective, the, the key thing is energy intake. So actually meeting energy requirements. So uh, that, that's fundamental. Um, so meeting the body's need for, for calories, because uh, ultimately cal calories are, are going to be the most important thing. And then the macronutrient distribution. So the, the, the consumption of carbohydrate, protein and fat, um, fluid and, and electrolytes, micronutrients, supplementation and, and fueling and recovery. Uh, so yeah, that, that's essentially the, the flow, uh, the decision-making flow for me. So obviously my, my objective, my aim, uh, or the aim of my role is to manage the nutrition element. Um, but my decision-making process begins with, with the game itself, uh, then utilizing uh, the demands of the game, um, and then converting that, those physiological demands into nutrition recommendations. Uh, but again, it, it uh, just to highlight the, the, the need for the individ, individualized approach, uh, every player is different. So position specific recommendations um, are, are really, really important. Um, and not only that, there's a number of different considerations as well. So we, we have goalkeepers are, are completely different from uh, outfield players. Uh, a substitute, so a substitute that comes on versus a substitute that doesn't play is con uh, considerably different as well. Um, so managing their, their nutrition intervention and, and their periodized approach is going to be it's very difficult. 
um, injury has a significant um, impact on on the period as plan as well or the period as model for, for nutrition uh, as does multiple games per week um, and then young players as well so if if you have a an 18 year old or a 17 year old like coming into your into the first team environment playing games they have the growth and maturation um, requirements as well as the game requirements um, so there's a number of different considerations that we have to think about uh, beyond just um, like the, the the weekly micro cycle if you like uh, there's a lot of um, complexities within that. So if we just take some, um, I'm not going to run through all of this, but just to highlight the um, the, the differences in outfield players and goalkeepers. So uh, obviously the, the physiological demands at the bottom, they will influence uh, the, or they'll be very different, if you like, um, and they will then feed into the individualized approach. Um, so that it's definitely um, no room for like a, a one size fits all approach, uh, which makes it very complex, to be honest. Um, and as, as a sports nutritionist, it, it makes it almost like a, a minefield, if you like. And um, it, it's very, very challenging. And, and just going back to the, the importance of communication, um, if the, the periodized model is communicated well in the initial stages, potentially even pre-season, and it's agreed upon, um, then I can develop um, a periodized approach to each microcycle and then um, obviously for each individual as well. Um, and then from there, uh, hopefully um, support adaptations, um, support uh, preparation and, and recovery and ultimately optimize performance. Um, so I have more slides, but I guess that will kind of feed into the, uh, into the, the discussion and, and potentially even the practical application of that. Uh, but that's pretty much the overarching, um, overarching way that I work and um, and, and develop uh, the periodized approach uh, to nutrition. And um, I hope that gives people a, an understanding of of what periodized nutrition is and and uh, how how it's kind of applied within uh, within the football context. Oh, brilliant! Thanks, Pat. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, three great presentations there some fantastic slides and i think yeah if we took all of you three in, in isolation we could all pack up now and, and go home and think yeah that's a, a pretty good session um but what we're going to do is um yes kind of the plan today is to integrate the three the three of you together as a uh, one mdt which is going to be one hell of an experiment as uh, all three of you of meeting each other for the first time today. Um, I think we'll start with taking it as a, with the group dynamic, that sort of overall periodization plan. And obviously as, as Matt just pointed out, as that progresses and how that would become more individualized, how it's assessed, how it's analyzed as we go on. Um, but I think the first point which all three of you touched on is that the game, the competition is where everything begins and the person setting that tone is the head coach which is your your role Jao. so see to a certain point is to sort of kind of now to set up what your plan would be for the week in terms of yeah what you're looking for from a session in terms of working with the players on the grass to obviously prepare for them to perform on on a match day yeah, first, first let, let me say that um, we are aligned. I don't know if you, you did for purpose, but I think our three are aligned with uh, the ideas because one of the things for me is the most important is to have an idea to follow, to have a game model idea, to have a way of playing. That's why this is not a theoretical uh, approach on the process, but it's, it's a practical. And when you, when you practice, when you train, when you believe on the methods, of course, uh, you, you will understand that you need to follow a path, you need to follow some idea. Because in terms of, um, I, I think that the head coach or the coach or the technical staff, if, if the technical, when I say technical staff, I used to say that the coach have a, a tactical approach, the, the, the number two have a tactical approach. But if you have this kind of coach that only focus on the tactical and forget and do not integrate physical qualities area and this this case nutritionist you can have you will have a big problem because uh, 
the, the fitness coach or the sports science coach or the sports science department, they will not know how do you want to play. And if you don't have an idea to follow, today you can play uh, in counter-attack style, tomorrow you can play in a possession style, and the day after you can play a mixed style. So this will have a massive impact on the, the, the physical quality of development. This will have a massive impact on the nutrition uh, qualities, of course, and, and, and work. So I think the first thing, in the, the core thing is how do we want to play? How do we want to develop our team to play? Uh, how we want to develop our individuals? So uh, if, like Matt said now at the end, uh, the individual approach is decisive. Because if you want to play under a certain idea, if you want to play, a, if, let, let's say, it's not my style, but if, if I have a, a counter-attack style, uh, my team should have the capacity to, first, in terms of psychological uh, competences, they should have the capacity to uh, stay in the game without the ball a lot of time. Sometimes for 40 seconds, sometimes one minute, sometimes one minute and a half. So they need to be prepared to stay uh, without the ball so many times during the game. And, and then, when we get, when we regain the ball, we should have the capacity to go and to to sprint, and, and then after sprint, if you don't score, you need to recover the, the 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 position, and then the zonal, and then you you should defend again, 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 and this kind of effort it's completely different if you win the ball and you play in possession and you don't play long balls or direct balls. So this kind of difference between styles. I think will have a massive impact on the process, not only in tactical, but mainly in all departments around 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 the process. So I think that's important, and I'm very happy. I will be very happy if we can work together the same stuff, because uh, these presentations they they have the same core idea. That first is the game, then you build everything. So uh, like, like Steve, like, like you said, uh, I believe that. This is not isolated uh, job. You don't. You don't. Uh, I, I. I don't see this kind of uh, work. Like you have a head coach, and then you have the number two. Then you have the physical coach, the fitness qualities. And another. I don't see this like this. I see this as a staff. Of course, when you when you work as a staff, when you work as a team, in terms of staff composition, these things will be linked uh, and. There will be, uh, I think, there will be uh, energy between all the departments. Very important to play on this. Event. So I think the court, the court thing is uh, congratulate Sebastian and Matt for his, their presentations. It was brilliant. It was completely aligned with my idea, and I think we 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 have some good questions here for a Q and A with our three, and of course Steve, you as well. You are free to to ask because probably you have some some questions to do. But mainly, with people uh, who are watching us, probably they have some some questions to do. But my question is, of course, um, first to Sebastian, uh, and I, I will work like this this way. Uh, every every week, every single week, I, I used to have two meetings with the staff. Uh, the first meeting is in the first day of the week. So if we play Saturday. We have a normal microcycle. Uh, we play Saturday and then we play Saturday again. Uh, I used to um, I used to meet with our our guys, not only the physical qualities, not only the nutritionists, but every ev everyone linked with the process, the video analysis, the nutrition, the physical qualities. Everyone we should meet uh, for to have to, to make a, an evaluation of what we did. In, the week, the week, on the week, on the match. So, and we after that, the second phase of this meeting will will be to uh, prepare the week. We, we will prepare the week. We will evaluate first, and then we will prepare. And the second meeting of the week is in the end of, of, of the week. So, on if we play Saturday, on Friday we meet again before the session, and we will see how how it was the week. We, we see individual, individual things about all the players. We see the team, and we will see and we will anticipate some scenarios that could happen on the match. So, I think th 
this kind of meeting for me is decisive. And one of the questions I have for Sebastian, of course, is um, I think for me as a coach, uh, regardless the way of playing style, I think for me the main thing is intensity. I used to I used to say that all the sessions for me should should have intensity. That all the exercises should be at the maximum intensity possible. Even when you play in the match day, when you practice in the match day minus one, the intensity for me is key. I don't like to have exercises. I don't like to build exercises without intensity. For me, that means nothing. Uh, even if you are practicing on the match day minus one, that exercise that they are slow. I, I, I don't believe in this kind of intensity on the training, training exercise. So, how do we can prepare in terms of effort and pauses and recovery? Blah, 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 all the exercise with maximum intensity. And the second question about this is, if you want to have intensity, how do you uh, evaluate intensity? What are the parameters that, that you see that, okay, this player is doing in the maximum intensity and this player as well, this player as well, how do you measure this kind of, of intensity parameter? Okay, thank you all. Uh, also, congratulations on your presentation. The same for, for Matt, uh, both of them fantastic. And the question is, uh, it's quite big. Uh, uh, intensity yeah. is, a, is a big word. I think, uh, I don't know which, should I, which, which, I, which question should I answer first, because uh, both of them are quite linked. But uh, I think intensity is a, is a word that is uh, used by everyone, sometimes without even knowing what does it mean to have intensity. And sometimes is a, the perfect uh, word for everything. Uh, if we lose as a team, it's because uh, we didn't have the intensity, but intensity in terms of what? So as you say, for the evaluation and everything. So I, I, I will try to, first of all, I'm going to start with the one about the drills and how to, uh, uh, yeah, how to deal with this intensity depending on, on the, of the target or on the main goal of the drills. So I, I agree that everything in the football pitch should be do uh, with intensity. But of course, uh, this intensity has to be controlled in some uh, scenarios in order not to have a, let's say, a not bad, but the, not desired consequences, depending on the day that we are and everything. So uh, I agree that uh, when you think uh, about a drill, uh, always uh, the players should have uh, the intensity, but in terms not just uh, physically, if you can call it like this, but also in terms of attitude. I, I think when we speak about intensity, we speak uh, in a big uh, component about attitude, and this intensity should be put by the players first of all in terms of concentration attitude within this drill, within this task. So in my case, what I do with a with with a coach that I am working with when he wants to work in a specific uh, drill. Uh, let's say, let's put an example, we are in a day minus two. Uh, we are coming from two very big uh, or strong sessions in the previous two days. Uh, he wants to work uh, in uh, specific movements, offensive and defensive movements in 11 versus 11 in a big pitch because he wants to work on that. And he believes it's important for us to do this drill. Even the spaces are big and the intensity can be very high. I think we have many uh, variables that we can modulate in order to control that intensity or in order to control that response. So for me, it's not the same if we do an 11 versus 11 where you don't stop or you stop every four or five minutes uh, down to do actions of one minute, one minute and a half. It's not the same to do three sets of six minutes of 11 versus 11 and to do 10 sets of uh, two minutes where you're gonna stop between each rep just to give instructions to, so you can keep working on something that you wanna work. It doesn't, because sometimes I, I feel like uh, some days of, uh, of uh, the micro cycle because they are in this tapering phase People sometimes it's like, it's an empty training, you know? It's like, oh, we have to train because we have to train, but 
we, we don't want to do anything just in case that we're gonna make them tired or anything. I think you can train, you can train with the same intensity that you were training in the overload phase, but you just have to regulate the volume and also the density of the efforts and just use the different tools you have in order to get the desired response of the drill. I don't know if this is uh, an answer of, the, if I am answering the first question a little bit, if, I mean, from the fitness coach perspective, this is what I will try to, you know, to agree with my coach. Okay, maybe you cannot do two parts of 20 minutes, 11, 11, but maybe you can do um, 10 times 11 versus 11, two minutes. And it's not gonna have a, any kind of impact or undesirable impact. And about the intensity uh, as a word, um, how to evaluate. I think, uh, as I say before, intensity, when you speak about intensity, you're speaking about a very big concept that includes many things. First of all, for me, intensity has to be a, an attitude. Like to, I will define it as the maximal effort that you can put in every aspect and in every moment, not just uh, physically or running or running, but also mentally. If I am really convinced that I want to go there or to run there, not just that I'm running at high intensity, but also that I'm running because I'm convinced that I'm going to get the ball. This for me is also intensity. But how to measure that kind of intensity is not uh, really easy to do it. But the truth is that I think even we don't have maybe the technology to objectively measure this uh, active intensity. I think you you have, and for me, the head coaches, you, you, you got this experience. And for you, with your eyes, you can see things that the, the screen cannot give you. So I think uh, there is a lack of observation. Sometimes we are losing the focus, just looking at the numbers and everything. And we are maybe not looking with our eyes what is happening on the pitch. And like this, I think you can really get an idea of the intensity that the players are putting on the training in, in all aspects. And then in terms of fitness, the, you, you can measure intensity as a, as a market to say, okay, uh, this player is doing these meters in these times, so or he's doing whatever meters per minute. And, but for me, this is a way to measure, but I, I don't know if I'm measuring intensity because maybe he's running these meters just because of whatever is happening on the pitch, not because he, he's not putting intensity. Maybe we are, maybe he's the left winger and we are playing on the right all the time. So does it mean that he doesn't have the intensity? For me, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have the intensity. So how I measure this intensity, I, I, I don't have an answer for that, to be honest. I, I cannot say if this player is intense or not intense. What I have to try to make sure is that this player, in case that he's going to be challenged to do whatever uh, he's asked on the pitch, whatever he needs to do and whatever demands he has to coach, he at least has the tools to, to face it and to, and to do it because he's ready for it. But as I told you, uh, you can measure it in terms of relative how many actions you do per minute. and It's kind of a, a marker of intensity, but it doesn't mean that if you don't do it, it's because you don't have intensity. I don't know if I, I have answered your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah because intensity is a, is a big, big question. It's a deep question. Intensity, yeah. of course, it's a, it's a, because sometimes uh, I think that you you touched on, on one of one of the things that I that I believe that it, it you don't have any days any days on the week that you don't do nothing. So uh, some some coaches I know that some coaches used to to see the match day minus the tapering the tapering session like match day minus one and two just to do something just to do anything. Uh, it's not my opinion. I think every day you should uh, use to develop some some things related with your team. I think that's you touch on that, and for me that's it's like that's, that's key for the process. So uh, that's I, I think that that uh, you you, uh, you asked me the, the, my question about the, the intensity, um, the measure of intensity. In my opinion, sometimes it's the the god speed of of the coach and, and the staff, not only the coach. I think should should we should look at the, the player or should look at the team and we should discuss well, 
uh, the attitude is correct? Uh, do you think they, they are doing everything? Because sometimes, and we cannot forget, uh, cannot forget the, the environment of, of, of the team. That the communication is key. Because some, some, sometimes the coach doesn't have the, the information that the, imagine that the nutritionist have or the, the physiotherapist have. And the player could, could, could be unhappy with the process. And he just, he just, he, he's just doing some, some uh, he's not doing everything. He's doing 90% or 80% because he, he doesn't agree or he's not happy about something. And I think this kind of communication is key for everyone. Not only the got speed of the coach, the head coach or someone linked with the staff, but the communication around that. Sometimes the physiotherapist comes to the, the coach and say, look, uh, this player is not happy. Uh, he's probably social things or things linked with him, or things link, linked with your decision as a coach, and you should know everything. I think that kind of communication is key around everything. And I will link the questions between. Sorry, I'm, I'm speaking a lot, but linking the, the two the two answers. First, I think the intensity is is this attitude mentality uh, in terms of physical qualities. I think it's important as well. To, to analyze and to evaluate if they are doing everything, if they are in their maximal condition. Uh, of course, we have some parameters like uh, I, I speed training, sprint, da, 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 like you have, like you said before. But the, the, I think this is important and we should watch live in terms of, okay, the session, we are controlling the session, we are doing the control, the session control, and sometimes I, 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 I used to I used to call the, the, the sports science or the physical coach, look how, how they are in, in terms of intensity, because this question will link with the second one, like this. Um, I don't believe in complementary session, like, uh, okay, we are in match day minus four, match day minus three, the, the density should be higher and the, the volume and the intensity should be maximum. Uh, we are in acquisition in the acquisition day. We should work in physical quality, in terms of physical quality. I'm saying we should work in the maximum level because the intensity will be uh, the same as the, as the competition. But the coach uh, just plan uh, exercise that they are not reaching out that quality. So probably the sports science department or the physical coach will ask the coach, "Hey, can I?" take this group and work with them because they didn't reach out the, the situation of physical quality uh, targets and we, we do complementary work. Um, I don't believe in this kind of, of work. Uh, I believe to anticipate scenarios like, okay, I'm the coach, we, we are preparing the session, that session, the day before, and I, uh, I ask you, look, hey, Sebastian, um, I want to do 11 v 11 because I think the team needs the tail, uh, things like that. Uh, and you say, look, but in terms of density, probably we are not reaching out the, the targets. So we need to uh, prepare this kind of session with different, with, with a different approach. You can do 11 v 11, like you said, but uh, two minutes we can we cannot stop. Two, in two minutes we have to, you cannot stop, you, or one minute you cannot stop and. Regard, um, if you are planning to, to do this exercise in 20 minutes, do not stop every time, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10, just stop one minute after they are doing everything and then 30 seconds, you are saying you correct. And so this kind of work, I believe more in this kind of work to achieve in the session, the, all the targets, not only in terms of physical, but everything integrated, like we said before in terms of tactical, blah, 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 uh, better than complementary work. Yeah. And you guys, the, the question is for you both guys, because it, this will have a massive impact also in, in, the, in the nutritionist, in the nutritionist uh, perspective, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Matthias, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I guess just going back to the, the intensity part. So that obviously like going into each session and trying to uh, attain and like or close to maximum intensity is that's going to obviously have a, a big impact on, on nutrition. Um, so a player's ability to maintain maximum intensity is obviously 
uh, kind of dependent on their, their glycogen stores, so the, the, the stored form of, of carbohydrate in the muscle and um, their recovery status as well. So uh, if the, the coach's objective and if it's communicated from the head coach that like each training session has to be like, there has to be intensity, then that kind of builds buy-in for the nutritionist's uh, recovery interventions because after each session or after each game, the player knows, okay, well, I have to, I have to train with intensity the next day, so I, I have to recover better. But it kind of builds, uh, brings up some some interesting like challenges because we know that um, intense exercise acutely um, diminishes or d- it impacts appetite. So um, for for a period of maybe two hours, uh, appetite is is like reduced um, after intense exercise. So if we have a really intense bout of exercise. Um, or training, then for two hours afterwards, uh, an individual's appetite might be depressed or suppressed, um, and that p- that period is is quite an, an important period of time for for refueling. So uh, we know that during intense exercise, that the door into the muscle is open. So obviously, gl- uh, glucose and everything travels into the muscle and then is oxidized for for energy. Um, and then for maybe an hour or, or an hour and a half after exercise, the muscle is like a sponge. So it's soaking up like all the nutrients it possibly can to, to recover properly. But we have that. So we have the sponge like effect where the muscle is soaking up everything, but we also have a, um, a suppressed appetite. So the player is not actually eating anything perhaps because they have no appetite. Um, so it brings up some some quite interesting challenges for the nutritionist and uh, providing like liquid based solutions after those after those um, intense um, activities uh, is is probably the the viable option. Um, and then obviously that feeds into the recovery intervention and, and the buy in uh, to, to the nutrition intervention as well. Um, but obviously, like training with with intensity will also impact energy requirements. So um, any time that the intensity or, or volume perhaps um, of, of training increases, then um, energy expenditure will increase as well. Um, energy expenditure from carbohydrate particularly, uh, because if anything's done with, with relatively high intensity, then carbohydrate is the one that's uh, utilized as a fuel. Um, so that will feed into, into the, 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 the meal or the meals ab- after, that, after that individual session. Um, and yeah, just the, the communication of that, like prior to the event, uh, is is really important because otherwise you're kind of having to like top up with uh, sports drinks and things. And um, so yeah, that's just uh, I guess my yeah. my thinking on that. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm gonna get back to yeah to the last thing that uh, you all said. Uh, I argue. I agree that the the best way for me also will be uh, when you speak with a coach or when you have this staff meeting, uh, you speak about what are going to be the contents or the drills that you're going to use in the next session. Of course, me as a fitness coach, I, I have to understand this drill is going to have uh, consequences in terms of fitness. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, drive to some demands so are we, let's say, covering or doing whatever demands we think are important to cover in this session with these drills? Yes, no, okay. Then I think you can advise or you can at least inform the coach because maybe he's not uh, thinking about this or maybe yes. Okay, coach, uh, you want to do this 11 versus 11, but today is day minus four uh, or, or whatever. Today is, uh, yeah, day minus four. Um, I was thinking that we should uh, get this kind of uh, acceleration, deceleration amount because, okay, can we uh, manage the different variables that we have in order to change this drill that you want to do, which is the most important thing because you want to really have an impact on the behavior of the player and the way we play and everything. This is going to be the key in the Sunday game and not uh, as much as the acceleration or deceleration that we do today, even it's important and even we need this in order also to cope with the demands of the game. So my first proposal will be to try to manage the drill in order to get everything because I think 
you cannot see training as drawer, I think it's a word in English, drawer, where you get the close phone. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have like different drawers and you get, okay, here we will put the physical in this the drill, here we will put, I think you have one box where everything is mixed and everything is there. So if you can get everything from the consensus of all the staff in order to design a drill, which is at the end our work, as a members of our football staff is to design also drills and good drills that we achieve whatever we are looking for. I think we have to really think hardly about the drills. Sometimes I think we do the drills just in a very simple way. Uh, we're going to do this, this. I think you need to really think about how I can improve this drill in order to get this and that and how we're going to regulate the drill even during the drill how we're going to stop how we're going to give the instructions everything in order to make the let's say the ideal of perfect drill that we have in our minds so if you can get it like this perfect will be the best option if, if not and you have to do this uh, compensation let's say of training because okay we haven't done mm, whatever uh, runs uh, we didn't get any sprint in this drill and we were looking for a sprint but the the way they played and the way the drill went uh, we didn't get it okay you can do it maybe in an analytic way which is not the best option maybe in terms of football but it can helps you out in other things like injury prevention so you need you you need that the, you know that the that you need to expose the players to uh, sprinting demands and you need to expose them to the maximum velocity. If we didn't manage as a staff to give the proper drill to get that, then we will have to compensate this. But it's not all, but then you have also to think if you put it in a scale, if maybe to put the players to make this sprinting after all the training because hey, you are missing three sprints, let's say, to speak in a general way, if this is going to have a good or bad impact in the player mentality or the player focus on the game if he's gonna get mad because he thinks he really uh, trained in a very hard way and the other one didn't train and you also have to take into account these kind of uh, troubles let's say and also when we use these kind of trainings that they, they, they are made in order to compensate or to to complete let's say the demands that you are missing in the drills I think, and I am, I'm using them. I mean, I use them, for example, with the non-starters. After, right after the game, I do this training in order to, you know, to complete the game demands and everything. I think we are a little bit uh, uh, obsessed about getting the number, the right number. Let's say I have a fullback that he makes a 1,200 meter high speed running per game, and I want to give him this load, let's say, and I say, okay, I, I, fin I do my high interval training session uh, and I get the number, I get 1,200. 1, but I think sometimes we didn't think about how we get the number. I mean, it's not the same to get it by runs of 100 meters than by runs of 200 meters or 50 meters or 20 meters. The body position in this running is is he reacting to a stimulus or not, or is he just coming back and forward? Of course, I'm not saying this is bad. I, I, I'm using it when I have to. I mean, sometimes I have to. But I think whenever we have the chance and we can do it, we have to think a little bit further in order to think not just how much, but also how we get this how much, let's say. So I don't know if I have answer. More yeah. or less. Yeah, I, I'm, I might play devil's advocate as well there. So uh, I completely understand where you're coming from, Joe. And uh, obviously, Sebastian kind of touched on it, but we actually utilize those like non football sessions uh, to, for, for like optimizing body composition um, and potentially even uh, like return to play as well in, and, and maybe even um, in, in pre season. So I'll just share my screen and, and show an, an example of, of how that would work within. Uh, within like my context, if you like. Um, oh, sorry. Gone from the start. So 
uh, we know from research that um, when you uh, train in the in the fatigued state, so when muscle glycogen levels are low, um, that actually acts as a stimulus to increase uh, mitochondria. So it, it, it stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis. So uh, th this is like a real crazy science lesson, I guess. But mitochondria is essentially the energy production site within a muscle cell. Um, so if you have more of those, then you can produce more, more energy. Uh, so it's thought that uh, the, the adaptations to this kind of training um, can improve the aerobic phenotypes, so endurance capacity, uh, potentially. So at the end stages of, of recovery from injury, so like return to play, um, when you're looking to like kind of redevelop or regenerate um, or develop those um, aerobic components, uh, it, it could be a, an idea to utilize those non-football, like running, basically, uh, running drills. Uh, potentially even in uh, in preseason as well, when you're looking to just target the, the aerobic components. Um, so this is just one example of, of how I uh, have done it or how I utilize this kind of training. So uh, breakfast, would the, the player would turn up, they would have their normal breakfast. Uh, they would do the normal on-field uh, pitch-based session with, with the head coach or the, the technical staff. Um, they would then have a low-carbohydrate lunch. So essentially that first training session depletes glycogen. So we know that 70 to 90 minutes of intense exercise depletes the, the level of, of glycogen within the muscle. And then if they don't eat carbohydrate, they're not going to refuel it or refill this battery. So at the, obviously going into the afternoon, their the battery is going to be empty so that the muscle glycogen is going to be low. So any exercise they do after that, there's going to be a stimulus to uh, the mitochondria to, or within the body to increase mitochondria. And remember that mitochondria are, is the energy production part of the, the cell. So you, you create more of them, essentially. Uh, and also you're exposing this individual to training in the fatigued state. So ultimately, the, the last 10 minutes of a game, they're going to be playing in the fatigued state. Uh, we want to try and expose them to that uh, because ultimately, it, it's, it's in my opinion, and, and so I've, some of the discussions I've had with, with coaches as well, is it's really important that we optimize uh, movements um, and, and performance in the fatigued state. So can they control their body when they're, when they're tired, when they're fatigued? Uh, ultimately, we can recreate that environment by, by doing this kind of thing, really. Um, so you can, you can utilize a ball if you like, but obviously with, in return to play, we, we tend to move the ball away and just keep it in, in a very controlled environment because obviously if, you, if, it's, if it's an uncontrolled environment, you, you increase the risk of re-injury. Um, so trying to control the environment, but obviously with a ball would be, would be the ideal scenario. Um, and then if this session is done in, in the fatigued state, then the signals to the, the physiological response will be to increase mitochondria. And then that is likely to have a beneficial effect on aerobic capacity. So endurance capacity. Um, again, it, 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 football is not about endurance. It's, it's a power speed sport. So um, this is not necessarily a thing that can be applied to everyone. But in certain circumstances, um, I've, I personally feel that it can be quite useful. Um, and then obviously the, afterwards the, they go about their, their normal day. Um, so yeah, that's just, again, just playing devil's advocate there really. That, th there are some contexts and, and circumstances where I believe those kind of things can be applied quite effectively. Um, but 100% agree with you, Jao, that um, football should always be the, the, the primary focus. Um, but on occasions there, there are kind of times where they, it can be quite valuable. Um, and, and also in the management of body composition as well, like training, we know that training and ultimately managing body composition is about managing calories. Um, but a, a way to do that is potentially getting them in prior to, prior to the training session and having them just like sit on a bike for 20 minutes to basically burn calories. Um, and that can uh, obviously then have a, a beneficial effect on, on body composition. Uh, so th I, I 100% agree with, with everyone. Um, but there are, some context where I would potentially apply that. Uh, Matt, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it was very interesting what you show. Uh, I agree 100% that there is room for everything. I mean, there is a context and circumstances where you can and you should train in an analytic way and you can do even not just with the fitness uh, target eh, or with the also maybe with the mental uh, uh, focus, you know, as you say, maybe 
I have to do an analytic way where I have to expose them to sprint and to fatigue just to see which players in this kind of difficult moments are the ones that they are going to keep pushing and the ones that they are going to just jump off, you know, the train. So I agree 100% that these drills, they have a room uh, and we can do and we should do in many occasions and in many contexts. Uh, something that the, that the, it got my attention uh, and now I'm going to just drop it as a new debate. Uh, you say about the doing this with the ball or not with the ball. Uh, I would like to to ask you and also, of course, you are. Uh, does it mean that if the ball is there, is a specific... Or what is a specific? I, I will say, the, my question will be, what is a specific training? This is a, yeah. Well, obviously, specific would be like trying to recreate a, a game scenario. Um, but with it, with an injured player, um, obviously, in that session when they're fatigued, you probably want to minimize the risk. Uh, well, ultimately, we're, uh, we're, yeah, we're just trying to minim minimize the risk. So if you can put them in a controlled environment where they're just running in straight lines, perhaps, um, or sat on a bike, um, I know that that's like completely away from football uh, and you, it, it's nothing to do with football and ultimately we're here to improve footballers but in that context I would prefer them to be in a controlled environment where they can then just focus on a physiological ad adaptation um, and then get them back to the field um, just by minimizing risk really. Yeah that, that's a very good question and um makes me makes me go to to another question that, that that's that's important kept my attention what matt said uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what i what i think it's decisive for for planning it uh, sometimes when you do double session uh, what 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 will be important for you uh, it will be uh, in terms of physical qualities um, development like okay in the morning, I will do the tactical, and in the afternoon, I will do the physical. So, um, for me, that means that uh, probably uh, you will will have something like this. Uh, if you uh, if you will work the physical qualities mainly, the main focus is, it will be the physical qualities on the afternoon, on the, on the the second session of the day. Probably you will ask for them to uh, the the attitude should be higher because they are. Um, like Matt said, uh, in terms of what is the fatigue state, it, it's much much higher when you when you work at the afternoon after the, the meal. Uh, uh, there will be more uh, the, the fatigue state will be higher, and you will push more for attitude at the afternoon second session to attitude. Or in the other hand, probably if you work physical qualities mainly focus physical qualities on the morning. Of course, always specific specific like Sebastian. Uh, touch for me specific is okay. If let, let's let's go back to the, the example that I gave before, in terms of if your style is, is imagine counter attack, that it's it's a, a easier example because counter attack means speed, and means a lot of speed and the reaction time. And so if, if you work in the morning, the physical quality, the focus in the afternoon, if you practice or if you focus on the tactical aspect probably you will develop not only the attitude, but you will develop the decision making under the fatigue state. And that's important because in the last 10 minutes, 20 minutes, if you play again against a team that will push you uh, harder in the last minutes, uh, for me, in terms of head coaching, in terms of coaching, for me, my perspective is I try to always control the game. Uh, always on control, always, since the first minute till the end. So to have my team control, to have my team to control the game, I prefer that in the last minute, regardless of the, the, the result, if we are winning 2-0, I, uh, I want to go for the third goal. If I'm winning 1-0, I need to uh, just not consider goal. And if we can score, brilliant, the second goal. So uh, I need to have my team control in terms of tactical position, in terms of decision-making qualities, blah, blah, blah. and this for me means a lot in terms of double session. 
not only the, the compensation session like we talked before but if you plan a double session in the day what should be your decision uh, physical qualities first in the morning and then sorry the tactic aspect or uh, in the other hand you should promote it. for me my opinion when people ask me even when my staff my staff members that we are discussing this for me always on the afternoon the tactical aspect in my opinion and I don't know if you agree, but uh, in terms of what I believe uh, of weak composition, of weak progress, or work in progress, I prefer static aspect because of this question. I, I need to, to assure that my team will control the game in terms of decision-making qualities of our idea since the beginning to the end. And in the end, we have, we, we have to assume that the fatigue state will be much higher than than, than the first half. Yeah, uh, in my opinion, about the, in this case, because we are speaking about a double session that uh, it may happen during pre-season. Uh, normally, in this period, you have this kind of uh, double session. Uh, so, to be honest, for me, uh, from the fitness part, I prefer to do the, at the end, both trainings are going to have a contents of everything, but it's true that maybe you focus a little bit more in prioritizing to get these uh, physical demands in one session and the other one to focus more on the tactical aspect to happen, however you want them to happen. For me, uh, it's better to do the, the physical part in the morning, basically because uh, during precision, mainly, we do a lot of strength and when we put this strength science says that it's better to you know to separate in the time the sessions of strength and the football session let's say so it's it's better based on what science said to, to do it in the morning so i prefer to do it in the morning because of that but it's true that there is also coaches that they want the other way around about what you say like you say, I want them to work in the afternoon tactically, even they are fatigued, because I want them to uh, be aware of this fatigue and to understand and to learn how to cope with this fatigue st uh, status in order to, to resolve whatever problems the, the game is going to give them. But there is also the other way around. Some coaches, as they say, I want them to be mm, totally rest because I want them to explain them whatever concepts and I don't want them to be in fatigue uh, because otherwise they are going to be tired, they're not going to be paying attention, they, I need them to be very fresh. This is the, the right word, fresh. I want them to, to be fresh so I can explain them whatever and then in the afternoon when we already did this and it's clear for them, then you can do uh, this um, mainly uh, physical uh, session. So I think it, it depends a little bit on the moment, on what you want to do with them, if and maybe there is, I mean, it's not like uh, you, in my opinion, I, I don't have to say uh, for me it's better in the afternoon or for me it's better in the morning. I think there is moments that yeah. because of what we are looking for, it's better to do it in the morning. Um, there is moments and context where it's better to do it in the afternoon. But I agree with, with what you say. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that, 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 that's it. Sometimes you need to be fresh. And for me, me fresh for me means, yeah, I, I believe fresh means uh, we, we used to, to use in Portugal and Spain. I, I, I know that it's the same, the same concept. Fresh is uh, fresco. You need to be clean. You need to, yeah. Yeah, you need to be able to, to do everything in the maximum intensity. So, and you need to, to be, um, at disposal to learn something, to, 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 to have the attention to learn something, so, and the energy to learn something. So uh, I think that the, the, the quick question, the key question is to, uh, this is specific, the exercise should be specific, like uh, my, I will say my, uh, in practical, in, in, in a practical example, I will say what, what, I, what I will do, imagine. My idea is not counter-attack style, it's a, it's a possession style, pressing style. Uh, if I want to to practice the pressing, the pressing uh, or, or the reaction, the transition, 
from attacking to defense in the pressing style, in the quick reaction style. In the morning, I will not do this without ball. I, I will focus on the physical qualities, but I will push them harder and, uh, of course, always agree with the, the fitness coach to say, hey, look, to, to achieve this, this level, we need to do the repetition density, da, 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 da. and then I will push them hard, 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 hard to make them work in terms of physical quality to reach out to the targets that we, we want to achieve. And in the afternoon, I will do the same, but uh, I will, we will build a, um, a conditioned game for these behaviors happen a lot. They happen a lot. And they, they already know what they need to do in terms of mentality, in terms of um, details, in terms of tactical details. But on the afternoon, they will practice. The focus will be tactical, but exercise will be built for them to apply what they did in the morning, but in a different, in a different uh, approach of, of the exercise. But the, the behavior are the same. A different, uh, I don't know if I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm being clear, but in the morning, the focus will be always the qualities, the physical qualities, but specifically, they will do specific and they, we, we will push them very hard to make them everything like, like, like we want in terms of not only tactical, but physical and attitude mentality. And the afternoon, the exercise will be built uh, like a conditioned game for that actions happen a lot in terms of density and for them to, to think. The players sh sh should, should feel that I'm tired, uh, the fatigue is, is higher, but I need to go. And I, I, I know what I need to do and I need to go. I need to go, I need to go. So this kind of uh, work for me represents a lot in terms of uh, acquisition acquisition and you will be you will feel that okay you, my team is prepared for the the last minutes of the match they, they will be in control because they know the task they already know the task in terms of specificity specificity and they know the right attitude and mentality and they are prepared in terms of physical qualities to do that every time every time of uh, every in every minute of the game so I, I will feel as a coach and we should feel as a staff that we are doing the right work in my, of course, in my perspective, some coaches, like you said, prefer that they need to be fresh and they need to uh, understand the details tactically and they, and they like to, to, to have mannequins and say, okay, you go there, now you go there, now you go there. But my approach on the game is a little bit different because I believe in decision making. I believe in opposition. I believe in uh, constant, um, constant variability in the match sometimes the opponent they are there sometimes they are there sometimes they are there and you should adapt on this position you should do the same behavior uh, that with the adaptation opposite uh, situation so i think it's a very good question and the other question if you if you allow me hold on yeah. Joe, i want to jump in sorry if you don't mind uh, no, no. On the time wise um See, we could kind of move the conversation on to the analysis and how you're evaluating what you're doing. I mean, the planning of your sessions of the periodization. So everything is beginning there with the game. Is it then again the same way when you're evaluating the training dose? You're beginning with what you're seeing in the game. And obviously you're going to be partly influenced by results, but how do you kind of disassociate what you're seeing with the results to evaluate? Right, this is what we're getting from the performance. How do we then weigh this up against what you're doing during the week in the training dose and adjust accordingly? Um, again, does that start with you, uh, Jao, and then Sebastian as a, as a fitness coach, how you're anal analyzing everything and evaluating everything that's going on? And then, and then Matt, I guess you're then also looking at it as well in a very individu individualistic way. Uh, yes, I, I will. I will be very short and, and try to be very objective. So, uh, of course, evaluation for me is everything. Uh, if you if you if you plan, you need to evaluate constantly. You need to always be in an evaluation mode. So, uh, for me, the main indicator of your work is the match. So, you are all working to perform. You are working. You are planning to perform. And you periodize to perform in a certain way. So. The games, the matches, for me, that, that they are decisive to evaluate 
where we are and where we should be in the next match and where we should be in the next time. So uh, the preparation is everything. We should be to the way. Of course, we have our weak structure. Uh, we we have our periodization in terms of weak composition, but everything everything will go around uh, of what we we evaluate in the, the match before everything. Uh, and and that, when I say everything, it's not changing everything. It's okay. We have our structure. How now we evaluate the match? How we are perform? How we well, how we did perform as a team? How we did perform as an individual? And now we will plan the week. Uh, to achieve a different, a different target, a different target, or we can maximize what we did, or we can change some things that we did wrong. We can do uh, just, we can be stick to the plan and do not care about the match because could be in preparation um, period. It, it depends always on the moment, but in my opinion, evolution is key. And if we can add someone to this panel. Uh, linked with video analysis, for me, it will be brilliant because the video an analyst, for me, is not only a guy that is filming and is trying to give some information. No, for me, a video analysis guy is as well a coach, uh, like uh, imagine Sebastian, probably Matt, not because nutritionist is not uh, is not conventional to have a nutritionist in the session delivering an uh, exercise. It's not conventional, but for me, I, I see everyone stuff like a coach like i think if we can add to a panel to this panel a video analysis for me it would be brilliant because the video analyst give us very good uh, very important information for us to, to plan again to prioritize again and the prioritization uh, for me means okay if you if you stick to a plan and you don't care about the performance uh, i think it's limited but if you always evaluate the performance the training section everything um, specifically, uh, I, I think you should you should you should do you should do adaptations on your your periodization during the week. Uh, that, that's why that's that's how I see the the, the week uh, the week building. First, you need to have a structure, and we are sticking to a structure. Like okay, uh, Monday uh, defensive behavior, small sided games, and then Tuesday this 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 large pitches uh, like this structure, and then. You, you need to, to, to do some adaptations and you need to have flexibility, like Sebastian said in the presentation, to, to maximize your idea and your work. Thank you, Joao. And, and Sebastian, I mean, I guess you're looking at it in very in similar, similar terms and you're sort of taking a reference again from the physical output during a game and, and seeing how that is relating to what you're doing during the week. Yeah. Yeah, at the end for, for me, the, the reference is always going to be competition. So let's say I, I take the, the numbers or you know, the demands that each of the players have during the game. And this is the reference that I use in order to assess each of the sessions. So I see the numbers are not just as a the absolute value, but also as a relative value in comparison with the game. So I can see the percentage on each of the variables that I believe that they are important for me in order to get this information. How did they do during training? And if we achieve, let's say, the setting goals that I said before the training, this, uh, this will be in terms of GPS and heart rate monitoring and everything. But also for me, it's, it's quite important, the subjective information, not just with the RPE uh, wellness questionnaires that we also use, but also for me, in order to evaluate or to assess the training, it's very important the, the conversation that, that you have with some of the players at the end, just uh, to ask them how they felt during the training. Uh, you can see how the team is doing or how this player is doing uh, through the process, you know? I mean, first of all, you have to know the players. So you can see if this player is improving, if he's uh, decreasing his performance based on how he sells you the information, let's say. So I think for me, not just all the GPS stuff and everything that for me is key and give me very useful information, but also the communication with, with the players and to feel a little bit how the team is. And if you plan a session that for you is going to be a very tough session, let's say, 
based on your idea or the numbers that you are planning on your mind. And then you can feel like the players want to keep training and they want to do three more sets because they are ready for it. And then this is giving you a lot of information that they can cope with the very high demands that you are proposing or totally the other way around. Maybe you're proposing a session that you believe is not that tough in terms of uh, fitness components and they are dead at the end and that gives you a lot of information how is the team status in terms of physical condition on the pitch and also I evaluate of course uh, the strength part in the gym uh, not just in terms of uh, uh, velocity based training and everything but also on the numbers of sessions that they are doing we try to record and to show them how they move if they have to improve uh, specific movements or so I think video analysis is very important on the pitch and also sometimes off the pitch you can give a very useful information to the players and to yourself. So how do you have it if you have players who are according to the numbers are training really well you've got the eye test you're seeing that they're training very well yet come match day it's not quite there. Is this then where those individual conversations come into play or are you able also to understand the, the reasons why uh, they may not be sort of hitting those physical levels and then you make your adjustments that way? I, I strongly believe that the, the best way in order to be fit for a football player is to play. I mean, to, to play on Sunday. So I... I have seen many times that I have players with the best numbers on training and they are supposed to be physically in the best status possible. If you test them, everything, they have the, the highest numbers in training, everything. And then when they come to the game, because they haven't played maybe in two months, a 90 minutes game, but they are training every day and they are, getting the, they are hitting the best numbers. But then it comes to the game and he tells you, hey, I'm dead. I mean, I, I, cannot, I cannot move. After 20 minutes, I, I couldn't breathe. And... If you see the numbers, they say that he should be able to cope with that. So I think it's more about trying to speak with him to see which is the problem, what is the limit. If it's a, because sometimes I think it's even a mental limit that he cannot really see where he is in the game and he's a little bit lost and this makes him run more than he should. And, but it's true. And the other thing is that there has always been I don't know if this is the right word because I don't know in English, but I would say there is always trainers and gamers <laughs> somehow. Like there are players that they are made to compete and there are players that they are made to train. I prefer the ones that they, I prefer the gamers. But uh, I don't know if I have answered your, your question like that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's perfect. Um, obviously, Matt, along, along similar similar lines. I mean, there's uh, looking at the players individually as nutritionists, as, are the numbers everything or you're also taking in other stimuli in terms of how you start to individualize those nutrition plans? Yeah, well, I mean, evaluating the, objectively the, the impact of nutrition in football is almost impossible. Um, I mean, ultimately that the best players will win games. So my objective, but potentially even Sebastian's as well, is having the best players available or all players available for every training session and every game. Um, not just available, having them fit as they, uh, as fit as they can be and, and as healthy as they can be. Uh, so looking at like blood parameters, looking at body composition, um, optimizing recovery status, um, subjective recovery status, subjective wellness. Um, if you can improve their life away from home as well, so like beyond uh, away from football. So if you can like get them more interested in in it, in food and and enjoying healthy food, that can improve their lifestyle away away from uh, the football environment, and that that's going to have a, a beneficial effect on them as an individual, but like longer term as well, they they can improve their wellness. Um, so yeah, just having having the best players available um, to, to for selection for for Zhao and. Um, and being as, as fit as they possibly can be and, and as, as good as they possibly can be. So obviously you utilize numbers where possible. Um, I try and like link different objective markers. Uh, so 
it's it, it's difficult to say that if someone is like six percent body fat that that's the like the, the best optimum zone for them for instance so i try and like have scatter plots where you have like a graph like this and you plot um like body composition uh, against a, a physical parameter so like high speed running or or like counter movement jump or something like that and sometimes you'll see that body fat where, where body fat decreases their performance actually decreases as well so over the course of a, a season or two seasons if you're lucky enough to have a player for that long you can essentially individualize a body composition or an optimum body composition for that player based on physiological or physical data and body composition data so you'll probably see there's num a number of examples in in the premier league if we're just looking at body composition where uh, players will be extremely lean, but their performance will decline. So in those circumstances, obviously my objective then is to increase their calorie intake, just to increase their body fat slightly. And that might provide more energy for them to perform better, recover better. Um, ultimately, they're maybe a little bit concerned about that because they see lower body fat as, as better. Um, but sometimes that's not always the case. So uh, I think have plotting uh, like... A, a, a body composition data against physical data is really important in that context. But yeah, it's, it's a really difficult challenge. And another like biochemical data, so saliva, for instance. So uh, just one way in which the nutritionist can actually inform the periodization model. So we did um, some data collection a, a few years ago on uh, match day plus one. So the day after a game, uh, we, did, we allowed them to come, like, have the day off after a game. Uh, and, and then we also allowed them to come in. Uh, so we, we studied them over a period of time. We took uh, saliva samples for cortisol, uh, various other parameters, so like subjective data um, as well. And what we found is that when we gave the players the day off, their actual physiological recovery was not as good as if they came in to see us, but subjectively they felt better. So physically, they, they, if we gave them the day off, they, they weren't as good the, the, the following day but subjectively they, they felt better. So you've got that subjective objective like thing, like challenge that do you make them feel better or do you make them actually recover better? Um, so obviously that data that we had, we, we met as a multidisciplinary team and, and that then started to inform the, um, the, the periodization model. And, and ultimately we, we thought that getting them to feel better was better and um, that psychological element uh, was, was probably more important um, at, at times anyway, obviously, if we have a period of congested fixtures, then we obviously push for the, the physiological component. But um, yeah, there's, there's a, number of, uh, a number of aspects there. But um, ultimately, yeah, just having the best players or all players available for selection on game day and um, in optimum condition, if you like, that's, that's my, my objective and, and utilizing as much data as possible. Um, I think sometimes like we can perhaps get a little bit too tied into the data because like GPS, for instance, like I don't think we're in a position right now to utilize GPS data to inform nutrition interventions. Uh, for instance, the algorithms utilized to assess energy expenditure with GPS is like not great <laughs> to put it mildly. So I, I don't think we're in a position there right now, but um, we can certainly use accelerations, decelerations to look like inform uh, recovery interventions, for instance, because we know that the muscle damage is going to be higher. And then it will actually inform the nutrition periodization model because you'll see spikes in, um, in load. And then you can obviously know that energy expenditure is going to increase on those days. So you have to provide more carbohydrate. And if accelerations, decelerations spike as well, then you know that immediately after that, there's going to, on the days following that, there's going to have to be a, a big emphasis on recovery uh, from a, a, an inflammation perspective. So more antioxidants and anti-inflammatories after that so um it's really difficult to evaluate the impact of nutrition because there's so many variables at play but uh, ultimately yeah just allowing shell to have all players available you've got uh, all your players available for your job but then yeah there was an interesting point that matt had there that obviously some of the findings around around a recovery day and i think you sort of mentioned that you're yeah, not one for giving players day off. So, but if you're getting that sort of information, do you, yeah, how do you take things in that may possibly go against what you are thinking and seeing? Do you still stay strong with your with your principles, or, or do you buy into what your 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 colleagues are are sort of suggesting? 
Ah, yeah, adaptation always, always adaptation because you need to be flexible. If you if you are not flexible, not not only in a, in a football planning, in, in a, a training methodology planning, I think you should be flexible in every planning, not only uh, linked with football or linked with sports. Uh, and this kind of flexible, I, I I used to have one principle, one one of my main principles to to plan and to prioritize is the sensibility. You need to be sensible to, to the moments, to the players, to the situations. And sometimes, uh, if you if you are stick so much in your plan, uh, you will have problems. You will have a lot of problems. You cannot forget that we are working with human beings. Mm -hmm. They are they are persons. They are players. They, they have some uh, some different characteristics that you, even if you plan in detail. They will give you always surprises because uh, the human being does does depend only on on his profile. Uh, human being depends on the moment, on the situation. Sometimes you you want to push them, you want to push a player very hard on the session, but he slept well. He slept not well. He slept very bad and is not is not available to to do that kind of work. Or he had a discussion with his wife and is not uh, focused on what you are saying. So you need to adapt to the situation every time. But on the other hand, I believe that you should not travel uh, uh, like, like the wind pushes you. Uh, you. You cannot follow the wind. You should follow a direction, you should follow a plan. And this plan you should follow, but you should make some adaptations to maximize this plan. And um, Back to the, the other question and linked with, with what you said, uh, what you asked, uh, I think that uh, the, the main responsible always, in my opinion, is the leader, is the coach, is the manager. I think, uh, like, I know, I know what Sebastian was saying and Matt saying that uh, you need to go behind and to, to, to fulfill the, the walls. So the, uh, ah, this, this is not correct, but I will do this. And then like that. Uh, uh, the, this is the kind of work that the top professionals do, like Matt and Sebastian. Of course, they, they do every time, and uh, you 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 need to 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 I, I don't know how the, the word, but you need to fulfill the walls. You need to to separate not the, the tick the boxes. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you, you need to, so because the, the the work is not correct by the who, who is leaving did some mistakes and th this is possible and every leaders in every areas they do mistakes they do some errors and people who works with with him uh, one of their main jobs sometimes is try to go and fix some, some, some problems that he did so th that's important that that's an important role but i think the main responsible for these mistakes and sometimes there are a lot of mistakes and sometimes the performance of the team is the result of the, uh, the quantity of mistake that the coach do, the head coach do. I think uh, coach should focus, the manager should focus in his responsibility because uh, I think that, um, like, let, let's focus on the physical coach. Physical coach. Sometimes physical coach says, uh, this player, he, he, he didn't dwell. On the match because he was very good, uh, and the coaches sometimes go to the physical coaches and, and demand like uh, they, they 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 didn't play with intensity. He's he's tired. What happened? What did what did you prepare in the last week? He's not able to play under this idea. Yeah. After 20 minutes, he, he was off. What happened? Uh, and the responsibility for me is not from the physical coach. It's the work together. It's the work integrated because. The key concept for me is synchronization. You can be, uh, in terms of physical qualities, you can be fit. You can be the maximum fit possible. You can be very good. But if you don't, if you are not synchronized in terms of task with your teammates, with your colleagues on the match, if you are not uh, identified with the idea of playing, if you don't, you are not in fact, you will run. Uh, bad, you will do bad runs. You will do, and you will lost. You will, you will lose energy without uh, a synchronization perspective, and this means that he's not able to play under that idea. And the responsible is the guy 
who, who is linking everything. And the guy is the manager, he's the coach. Okay, the synchronization for me is key to, to, to don't have players, like Sebastian said, players very good for training and all other players very good for, for only for games. And of course, we know that some players, they, some experienced players mainly, they, they don't spend so many energy during the week to be energized on, on, the, on the, the match. We know that. But experienced players, not all, but a big part of these kind of players, they know that, okay, I know what to do. Uh, I, I understand what is my task, but I will, I, I will, um, I will manage the energy during the week to be maximum energizing the match. So uh, we, we understand that. But sometimes when we watch players, they are very good in terms of physical quality during the week and in the match they are not doing well. Probably one of the main reasons is not synchronized with the idea, with the players, with the, the gaming plan. And I think the, the main responsible is the coach to synchronize everything. I think that that's, for me, it's that, that's the key idea. And that's one of the my responsibilities as a head coach that I, I like to have in my in my back. I like to to think like this. Do not point the the finger to hey physical quality is not playing with intensity. Why? It's the same the same example. Like you can play an instrument very well. You can be the best, but if you are not synchronized with the the band, probably the music will be will be very very bad. So you need to be synchronized to. Uh, understand that this guy is very good, but he's very good when he plays with this guy very good in terms of synchronization. And in football, I think it's the same. So in terms of your roles, um, probably break protocol here and, and um, not let the head coach have the, have the final word. So I was gonna ask Sebastian, in terms of that synchronization, where do you get the balance of being proactive in your role and, and being reactive? Yeah, I, I think this depends a lot on, on your personality and also on the coach personality. So I think, as you all say, the, the leader at the end is the coach. Uh, and I think all the people that is around the coach is there to help the coach and to help the team. So we have to understand that our role is is important but it's not the most important one i think sometimes the problem in the staff is that everyone thinks his thing is the most important one and the one that has the biggest influence i think we have to be humble enough to know that we are there and we are important and, and we need to be there but in that way I, i'm i'm proactive because I, I try to propose things to the coach. I try to give my opinion in everything that I think that it can help. But at the end, I'm there for the needs of the coach and the needs of, of the team. So in terms of uh, planning and everything, uh, in my case, I have been working with the same coach for a long period already. So I have uh, uh, the confidence to tell him whatever I believe and he gives me uh, a big space in terms of uh, decision making and everything but I know that you can get to the different position where you are there just waiting for whenever you are asked to do whatever in my case I, I, I don't wait to be asked I'm there before it, my presence is asked let's say but I think this is also because we know each other already and we know exactly how we work uh, we work together let's say but uh, yeah i would say i'm more proactive than than reactive i would say oh, yeah. uh, matt a sort of similar question for you i imagine you'll echo a lot of what sebastian just said so i'll also stretch it out to you in that synchronization not only with the with the coach but then with the individual players that you're working with yeah i, I guess you have to be both as sebastian said like initially being proactive is is really important and uh, that's where it, if communication is is good and the lines of communication within all departments is is good then you can plan properly and you can uh, essentially follow that plan as, as best possible but then i think you also have to be like fairly reactive in in the in the sense that after a session someone might need something different and it, it 
uh, what happened in that particular session might influence uh, things slightly differently. So that's where you have to have like more of a reactive approach. But yeah, tr trying to have open lines of communication within each department and, and sharing information um, and yeah, being being predominantly proactive, uh, but having the ability to be reactive where possible as well. Um, and I also think going back to Sebastian's point about um, obviously not overstating the, the, the importance of your, your role. Uh, obviously, nutrition is, is a part of the puzzle. It's probably a small part of the puzzle, uh, but a nutritionist within a team has to be quite enthusiastic. Um, so it, 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 I'm dealing with a group of players that probably don't really appreciate the role of nutrition. So I have to go in there with like all guns blazing, enthusiastic and, and really deliver messages quite um, emotionally and and so that kind of seems like I'm like almost overstating the impact of nutrition like saying that nutrition is the most important thing like that's just a show that I'm putting on uh, just to try and build buy-in and, and build trust with the players if I didn't do that the players would just go about their business and, and, and just basically ignore nutrition but um, it, it cannot sometimes appear that like a nutritionist or a sports scientist um, is like kind of values their role too much and thinks they're too like more important than others but in actual fact most of the time that's just an act um, that's just an act that they're putting on to try and like build relationships and, and build trust and and i think in the media sometimes that that message gets a, a little bit confused as well because you'll see sports scientists like getting in, like involved in things and and the reality is that's probably just uh, just an act to try and build build relationships with with players Oh, perfect. Um, yes, so on that note, Matt, uh, yeah, I think that's a, a good place to uh, wrap it up. So uh, thanks to you, Matt Jones. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. It's uh, great to chat with you again and definitely share ideas with Sebastian and, and Jara. It's really, really interesting and uh, great that we shared some ideas as well. It was, uh, well, shared like, yeah, same ideas, I guess. Um, so that's, that's really nice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Seems yeah, like as Giles said, you're all aligned. So we sort of a ready-made MDT there. Um, so again, thanks to Sebastian Lopez Bascon. Thank you so much, Steve, for the invitation. Uh, it was a real pleasure to to chat with all of you today. It was a pleasure to meet uh, you all, and Matt. And also, uh, I'm pleased that the, we share uh, many of our ideas, and I think the main core of our mentality is is aligned, as you say. Uh, yeah. It was uh, a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, I lie. I am going to give the final word to the head coach. So uh, a big <laughs> thank you to, to Jarl uh, nah, Thank you so much, uh, Steve, for the invitation. Uh, thank you so much, Sebastian and Matt. Uh, very good discussion. I, I will be a much more prepared coach from, from, from today because the discussion was very, very good, very, very rich. And yeah, just just to, to give the, the final touch, I think um, the I think the role to be humble is not humble is not only from the, the guys who works for a coach. I think the coach as well. The coach should be humble to understand that everything everything linked with the process, the mainly everyone linked with the, the staff composition, uh, everyone it is important because these communication channels should be perfect to show the players that we are working in the, in the same direction because one of the main problems that the coach or that the team could, could have is the players understand that something is wrong with the staff something is wrong with the communication between the staff and when you have the uh, of course ideally a perfect communication between everyone i think it's i think it's it, it's key for for the, for the team performance so Humble. I think everyone should be humble. Mainly the head coach to understand that everyone is important. And like like we we listen here today, um, it, 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 a coach who does listen what people like Matt and people like Sebastian have to say and have to to add to the process uh, is not a good coach for sure. So thank you so much for the discussion. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, I wish you all the best. I wish that we can meet again in the near future. And anything you can ask, please, uh, always available.